So the first video I ever uploaded on this channel is of me trying to create this desolate phone booth render in Blender. And I think the render turned out alright, not too good, not too bad either. And I thought it would be a cool idea to try and fix some of its issues and try and make it a looping animation after almost two years of making it. So let me show you how it went. Before we start, this video was actually supposed to be a Patreon exclusive video, but I thought I have no reference video on there for you guys to watch and decide if you want to join it or not. So I thought I would make a free one just so people who can afford it can get a better idea of what to expect in there. So that's what this is. This video is going to be a little slower and a little longer than usual. So I hope that's not too boring for you. But let's get to the breakdown now. I think the biggest problem the render has, in my opinion, is this asphalt floor, which is just so very obviously procedural. Back then, I had recently learned how to make these puddles and had wanted to try it. And like an obvious beginner, I overdid it. And I think anyone who has used Blender or any 3D software for a few days would immediately spot the noise texture in there. So I tried fixing that first using a better floor texture. So I scrolled through some asphalt textures on the Blender Kit add-on and found this broken asphalt mud kind of texture which looked way worse than the procedural one and i just immediately went into this existential crisis i mean had i just gotten worse at blender over the two years how is that even possible i was almost about to drop this idea literally at the first failure that i came across in this render thankfully a better idea hit me later that day as i was working on this shot for a short film i've been working on in the background which is why am i even using textures when i could easily be using some floor photo scans instead I'll never be able to fake that kind of fidelity through just textures. So I just went on to Sketchfab and found this amazing concrete floor photo scan on there and just plopped it into my scene and everything looked a tiny bit better from there. Obviously the base below the phone booth was also quite weird. I don't even know where it is. How did that structure even come about on that surface? Like how did that elevation even happen? It, it doesn't make sense. So I found another concrete based photo scan on Sketchfab and replaced it with that. But the render was still looking worse than it had been before. And I thought the lighting was to blame now. So I tried a cool little trick and tried to light the scene from the opposite direction of the camera because that sometimes yields really cool results. Not here though, not today. The lighting guards were not on my side yet for this render. So we keep working on it. And I think the next thing I did was add some bump into the photo scan I had just placed as the floor. I think that helps lose that blobbiness every photo scan tends to have and gives it these nice and sharp details, especially on something like a concrete floor. And now it was time to fix the water situation. And because we had this photo scan, there was no need for a procedural water system. Just a plane with a water-like material dipped into the photo scan creates this natural puddle effect with no effort at all. And on top of that, if you add a musgrave texture into the bump of the water material, you've got yourself an even better looking puddle than before. Obviously, don't just let it apply that bump everywhere. Add a noise texture into the factor of a mix node and let that musgrave texture pop up only in a few places so as to hide the obvious proceduralness of it. Now another big problem that the render had was the location of it. I don't understand where this phone booth is. Is it in a parking lot? Or at the side of a road? Or inside a house even? I don't know. So I started looking for some road blockers and barricades so I could make it look like the side of a national highway or something and settled with this nice photo scan of a barrier that had a dangly broken metal bolt hanging off it. The render was still looking quite rough, so like any seasoned 3D artist, I went right to the volumetric cube and started messing with that and see if that could help fix the scene. I messed with the anisotropy slider this time, which I did not at that time know what it did. Don't ask me what it does right now either. I don't know how to explain it. I don't think you know how to explain it either. We just know what it does, right? Visually, we just know what it does. So let's just leave it at that. By the way, somewhere in the middle, I must have forgotten to record it, but I replaced the previous concrete floor with this nice and broken one instead. This brings a little commotion into the render, some action, if you will, which the previous one didn't have. So yeah, I did that somewhere in the middle. I can't seem to find the footage for it anywhere. So let me just pretend that I did it live, like people do on Instagram Reels. Yeah, there we go. All right. I think that looks believable, right? All right, moving on. I think at this point I was bored of fixing small things and wanted to get to the good part or what I thought would be the good part which was animating the whole thing. So I started with the phone receiver. The plan was to dangle it off like it had been thrown away in the middle of a call. So to start it off I just deleted the ugly looking wire I had made earlier and just replaced it with a curve so I could animate it. The first idea I had was to try and animate it using the wiggle bones add-on, which is really good for emulating rope physics, so I made a rig for that. And if you're not aware how the wiggle bones add-on works, 
It just tries to simulate the secondary motion based off the motion you create at the head of the armature. So for this wire, I would set the first bone as the head and the rest of them as tails. And as soon as I press play, it will behave like a rope. Or, or not, I guess. Shit, I think I might have screwed something up here. Hold on. Here we go. Alright, this is how it was supposed to look. Like a whip, usually, when you first set it up. But then there are a lot of options in the add-on that you can change to affect the stiffness and stretchiness of the bones. And I did that. A lot. And no matter how much I tweaked it, the wire kept looking more and more like a penis rather than a wire. And at some point I tried parenting the phone receiver to one end as well to get the full effect. But that didn't go quite well either. And adding a wind force on top of that just made it hard to even look at so i had to finally make a shift to a cloth simulation instead but if you apply a cloth simulation to a curve you'll immediately notice that it just folds into itself like a piece of cloth wood which is obviously not the effect we're looking for so a better way to do it would be to use the skin modifier instead just make a row of vertices mimicking the shape of a wire and apply the skin modifier on it with a subsurface below it to give it that wire look and now if you add a cloth sim on this it does a much better job at simulating a wire also make a note i made all these simulation changes in a separate blend file it's a stupid idea to try and do them here in an already heavy scene with so many high quality photo scans in there so i always take such simulations outside the scene into a new blender file in order to get smooth playback and less crashes so make sure you do that too for your animations but at this point all this trial and error with the wiggle bone simulations and now these wire simulations had just drained me out so i wanted to move on to something else for a little while i knew i wanted some flickering police lights in the scene to portray a crime scene here and i thought i could be clever and use a police siren video clip as the light source but that even though still a clever idea is just a lot of work to make it look right so we just settled with two area lights stuck together and parented to an empty which then I would use to rotate them, like a police siren. By the way, if you're trying to make looping animations, I think this animation tip is worth a million dollars. So what you do is just create two keyframes for the rotations of the lights, first one at zero degrees and the second one at 90 degrees. You make sure the keyframe extrapolation of the animation is linear by pressing T in the timeline and choosing linear here. And then you press shift E and choose linear extrapolation. And that change you made in the animation will repeat itself forever in the timeline. And not just that, you can change the position of the second keyframe to adjust the speed of the animation live without the need of any other keyframes. If you knew this tip already, I'm sure you would agree how important this is to know in your animation workflow. And if you didn't, I would highly suggest you try and remember it for any future projects you might have. Next, I wanted to create a moth cluster near the light source as I had in the initial render, but this time I needed to animate it. And I think everyone has seen the moth video by Ian Hubert by now, and I'm sure if you're smart enough, you will just do as he says in that video. I don't know why I thought I could do better, cause I began with a photo scan of a moth, which by the way had almost 300k vertices. That should have been the first sign to stop, I think, but I didn't because I immediately tried to animate the wings of the moth using shape keys. So selecting the wings from this photo scan was a fun experience. Wasted almost half an hour just trying to isolate that. Then creating the shape key itself was another fun experience. Proportional editing isn't that fun when your mesh is just a blob and nothing else. But somehow after spending almost an hour on this wretched moth, this is the best I could get. And let's not even talk about the particle system because I don't even have the footage for it because Blender just kept crashing. I don't know why. I was just trying to create a simple particle system with a simple 300k polygon photo scan model in it. Why would it crash? Doesn't make any sense at all. Fucking idiot. So we go back to the simple 10 polygon moth because that's all you need really. Because when I set up the particle system, the moths were moving so fast that you couldn't even tell the difference. There was so much chaos in that particle system that it didn't matter how detailed the moth was. So don't try and be as smart as like me, just follow the tutorial as is. Just in case you need a refresher, this is how you set up a moth particle system. You create a moth that looks like this. You create a base shape key for it. Then you create a new shape key and go into the edit mode of the moth and just place the wings at an upward angle. Then when you come out of the edit mode and slide the shape key, the wing should be flapping. Now you add an arbitrary keyframe on that second shape key and go into the graph editor and just put a noise modifier on that keyframe and you should get a flapping animation just like this. And if you add the stepped interpolation modifier and the limits modifier on top of the noise modifier, you can get an even better binary flapping effect. So try and use that as well. 
After that, it's just a matter of creating a few variations of the same moth by offsetting the noise by just a bit every time you duplicate it. And now you should have a collection full of flapping moths. Now we create the particle system using a simple plane and selecting the moth collection as the emitter object. It's important to select the Boyd's physics type under the physics panel here in the particle editor and choosing the flock type in the Boyd brain section. And that's it. You've got yourself a moth cluster just like that. And I think this was the point when I first rendered the animation out to see how everything was looking. Not great, but not a bad start either. So I kept moving on. Also, at this point, I think I was happy to go back to the phone and the wire that I'd left behind all this time. And I was happy with the way it was dangling with the new cloth sim. But obviously, we can't have the part where it begins the simulation in the render. I just wanted the receiver to sway in the wind a little bit and that's it. But even that was harder than I thought it would be. Cause these wind and turbulation force fields are just like any other simulation. They are really hard to nail down to get the exact effect you're looking for. All I did was add a turbulence force field sway around the wire and the phone with very little strength. You must be asking why sway it around the phone and not just keep it stationary. Cause that will always give you a flappy windy laser like this. Having it move around the source gives the whole simulation a very dynamic effect. So yeah, try this trick in your next force field simulation. I think after that I animated the water which is super simple to do, at least the way I did it. All you gotta do is make the Musgrave texture you plugged into the bump 4D from this drop down, and then you gain access to the W field, which you can just slide through to animate the texture. I used the same linear extrapolation technique I showed you earlier to control the speed of the ripples here. At some point I do remember putting a dynamic paint on the water and the shoe as well, so I could plant ripples around the shoe, but that effect would be super hard to loop, because I knew you cannot start the dynamic paint effect before the frame zero, which you can very easily do in a cloth simulation or a particle simulation. What I meant by that is say I had that phone dangling situation where it would start from that top position to then eventually simulate to a rest position as I wanted. I can very easily get rid of that initial motion by just starting the cloth sim for the wire before the zeroth frame. So all that initial motion is done before my animation is started. Same with the moths or any particle system actually. I don't want to see the moths take birth in front of me when the animation begins. I want them already there when the animation begins. So you just set the start frame to something like minus 240 and solve that problem. But you cannot do that in dynamic paint. It always starts at frame zero. You can't go to something like minus 100. So as a solution, you could just start the animation at 100 frames. But I had everything already set up and baked from frame zero. And the ripples didn't make any sense. So my lazy mind just got me get rid of it. And I just placed the shoe somewhere else, outside the puddle. Problem solved. Or averted, if I'm being honest. Alright, now a small little tip. It's not always recommended to render the whole animation out just when you want to see how everything is looking. I think a lot of the times, just to test out the overall feel of the render, you can just get away with a solid viewport render or a material viewport render. Like for the ripples, I just looked at the material view render and knew the final render would be okay. For the mods, just the solid view alone was enough. So rather than wasting time on full on renders all the time, go to view and select viewport render animation instead sometimes to save a bunch of your time. Also bake all your simulation and particle effects and dynamic. It makes your playback much lighter and you also don't risk losing that particular moment that you spent hours nailing down. Cause it happened to me once and I have been baking everything ever since. Moving on, I think I next added a bit of camera shake using the camera shake if I add on, which is pretty standard and pretty straightforward. I added another layer of a ground photo scan that had a lot of pebbles in them to integrate the water and the floor even better than before. And I think that was it. That was all I did for the basic art direction of the scene. But then came the biggest problem of the render. As I said, I wanted the animation to loop and I thought it would be easy to do. And it was for the most part. The water ripples because of the linear extrapolation technique was just looping perfectly since the beginning. Same with the blue and red lights, nothing complicated there as well. For the dangling phone, as I showed you, I spent a lot of time fidgeting around with the turbulence force field to get a very subtle moment that almost loops seamlessly. So even that was okay. The camera shake is also pretty simple to loop. The camera shake if I add on has a very handy manual timing checkbox that you can use to set the overall time of the camera shake. And in Blender, you automatically get this onion skin when you sift through the manual timer in the add-on to see where the initial first frame of the camera was. So all you gotta do is find a point in time where the distance between the first frame and the last frame is the least. And you're done. Also, in the edit, you can fine tune that even more. Just match the first and the last frame and keyframe the position so that they match almost perfectly there as well. So all my moving bits with a little bit of effort were looping almost perfectly. But then came the moths who refused to loop no matter what. 
See, it's really easy to loop a normal particle system. All you gotta do is make two identical particle systems and just line them up perfectly one after the other for them to loop. I'll link a video in the description if you wanna learn doing that. But the buoyed physics type is just random. It produces random results every time you duplicate the system. Or maybe I was doing something wrong, but I wasted almost two days trying to figure out how to loop the moths and I couldn't. So finally what I did was sift through the seed value and kept flipping between the first and the last frame and find a seed with the distance between both the first frame and the last frame was the least. And this was the best I could get. And since their movement again is so chaotic, you don't notice it much unless you're just looking at them. So eventually all the loops did kind of work out, but the moths had me in a rut for a very long time. And while editing the video, I realized I could also do this. I could render the moths on a transparent background with all the right render layer settings and just handle the looping situation in the edit rather than within Blender. Just like I did for the camera shake. Or maybe what I could do was reverse the animation for the last few frames so the first and last frame end up being the same. It is so much easier to do that in the edit rather than in Blender. But just in case you know how to do it within Blender, I would love to know how man because I almost ripped my hair out trying to figure this out. So please let me know. But I think after that, everything was smooth sailing. I rendered out the final animation in an EXR format. In case you're still rendering in PNG, stop fighting the EXR format. I fought that format a lot too, but PNG is just obsolete at this point for animation. The EXR format is much better than the PNG format. So just follow this Polyfure tutorial if you're struggling with it. he will literally hold your hand throughout the process. But for the love of God, just stop using PNGs. That's it. That's all I had to say on that matter. Let's move on. Then I did all my post processing in Resolve, which is nothing but layer after layer of dust and smoke and rain and noise and flare just on top of each other. Almost all of them are in the screen blend mode and the opacity is driven way down. The color grading is super simple too. In case color grading in Resolve scares you, which scared me as well for a long time. Believe me, it is very, very simple if you watch the right tutorial for it. It is very similar to the node workflow that Blender follows. So just watch this tutorial by William on color grading your renders and you should be good to go. My color grading was super simple too. So let's just take a look at it. So the first two nodes are just so Resolve can understand the EXR files we brought in from Blender. Again, watch the Polyfure tutorial for it. After those two nodes, I have a note for adjusting the overall contrast of the render. How do you adjust contrast? You go to this little wheel icon and drag this contrast slider. Or even better, go to this little curve panel and use this curve instead to adjust the contrast. Just like you do in Photoshop. Just make a little S to add some punch in your render. After that, I adjusted the overall temperature and saturation of the render which again you can find in this little wheel like panel. I added another node so I could boost the overall color in the render, especially for the red and blue lights that flicker around in the scene. After that, I added a glow node, which is just an effect that comes pre-packed and resolved to add a little bit of glow on the whole scene. Oh and yeah, within Blender, I totally forgot. I also used the better bloom node that you can download here from Gumroad, which will help you get much better bloom than the regular glare node in Blender. So definitely make use of that as well. But yeah, I also added some extra glow within Resolve just to drive that effect home. Then a little bit of vignetting, which is just making a very basic mask around the render and then lowering the overall brightness of the render in that region. Super easy to do. And after that, I just added a little bit of chromatic aberration within Resolve. I had some lens distortion in Blender as well, but it wasn't prominent enough in the final render. So I just added another layer here in Resolve. And I guess that's it. And I'm sure a lot of you who are new to color grading must be thinking like I did at one point, why do we even make all these nodes? Why not just apply all these adjustments to the clip directly? Why complicate the process? So the nodes basically allow a non-destructive workflow, just like how Blender modifiers allow you to make changes till the end, the nodes here do the same thing. You can adjust the contrast and temperature and glow and chromatic aberration separately anytime you want. So we use nodes, that's it, nothing else. Why would anyone want a destructive workflow where you lose all the control once you have made a change? And that's why most softwares are moving towards a node-based workflow. It might seem scary at the beginning, but it's not. <laughs> it just looks scary, but it's really easy to learn. So just go watch that tutorial by William for your render's sake. Anyway, now what a good experienced colorist would do at this point is add a node right off the color boost node, which by the way, you do by simply pressing Alt plus S and then use these wheels to color grade the whole thing. If these wheels scare you, they scare me too. But simply put, they just handle the shadows, midtones, and highlights in your scene. You can literally see that mode if you click on this log wheel icon here. 
but I think it is recommended you make adjustments using these lift gamma gain nodes because they mathematically behind the scenes allow more control over the values in your render. There's a wheel down here to raise and lower the values. Use them to test everything out. But I am still learning how to color grade as well. So take all this information with a little grain of salt. But I promise I'll make an elaborate video in the future once I have a better grasp on this topic. So yeah, we'll skip the manual color grading phase for now and just use a pre-made LUT or lookup table that will do the color grading for us. To apply the LUT, I just added an adjustment clip over everything in my timeline and applied a LUT I liked that I downloaded from freshluts.com. Now how do you apply a LUT in Resolve? Right here on the right, there is a section called LUT that will open up a bunch of options for you. You just hover over any of them and see what impact they create on your final render and just double click on the one that you like the most. But yeah, I think that's it for the final post processing. The sound design is also pretty normal. I used almost all these sounds I got freely from the software called Soundly. So definitely give that a try. I used some sound effects from Pixaway, which also has a good collection of sound effects. And then a mix and match of free and paid sounds I found on the internet. And I just layered them one after the other. There's dragonflies, winds, bees, grasshoppers, underwater sounds, police sirens, and just a bunch more sounds that make sense in the sea. Just like the dust and rain overlays in the video layers, sound design is just about layering good sounds over one another. Don't overdo it, but also don't just stop at like four or five sounds either. Make it as detailed as it should be. Last thing I wanted to talk about in this render was these weird artifacts you get when you render your animation in cycles that have a really low sample count. That frustrated me a lot too. Just search temporal denoising if you aren't aware of this. But basically Blender is just generating a new noise pattern in every frame that it is rendering and hence this weird squiggly painterly effect that we see in the final result. And the most obvious fix for this problem is to just crank up the sample so the denoising doesn't affect the render much. But I couldn't afford to do that especially in a dark render like this with a ton of volumetrics. So after a lot of research I found this amazing free add-on called Super Image Denoiser made by Pigeon Tools which just brute forces the denoising process and doesn't create any artifacts even at a low sample count of 50 at 4K resolution. I mean it's still there but it's very minimal. It's just a compositing node that as I said just brute forces the denoising process with all these passes you see here. The denoising process definitely takes some extra time but since you're generating much less sample counts it's still a good deal here. Each frame in my render took about 2 minutes with this add-on. So the whole 250 frame animation took about 8 hours to render and for the final edit I just compiled these 240 frames one after the other 4 times so I could extend the dust overlays and the sound design for a longer time. And I guess that's it. That's all I wanted to say about this render. I have all the source files and the final render with every pixel and grain properly rendered out without the YouTube compression here on Patreon along with all the source files and necessary links. So definitely check the Patreon out if you found this video useful. But that's it for this video. Let me know your thoughts in the comment section below. I'll hopefully see you guys in the next video. So thanks for watching till the end. See you next time. Bye bye.